Hello and good morning friends, welcome to the CEC EDUSET live lecture. Dear friends, today in this session we would be continuing further with our series on history of literary criticism. In previous session yesterday we discussed in detail on Pope as critic. We would be discussing further on Pope and uh, would be getting uh, the in-depth knowledge uh, on the criticism uh, by Pope. Dear friends, for this discussion we have once again with us in our studios Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya. Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya is um, from Formerly Vice Chancellor of Kurukshetra University, she has he has authored numerous books, and uh, we would like to tell you all that he is appreciated by the students both in India and abroad. So let's welcome our guest, Professor Bhim Singh Daya, and let's try to grab in-depth knowledge on the topic. Hello, sir. Welcome to today's lecture. Thank you. Well, we resume our discussion of Pope's essay on criticism, and uh, its essay by title. Sure, but if you go into the matter that it contains, you will find it's not really an essay, because essay is with a set theme which is developed through the pages and then concluded. So it is one uh, whole piece, whereas here in Pope's so-called essay, you have just a series of statements and those statements are dismissive of others and applaud for himself. Of course, he has uh, appreciation and reverence for the ancients that uh, is undoubtedly there. But then he can't help hitting right and left uh, the rivals that he had in his own age. So we did almost half of the essay yesterday and we shall resume today the same discussion and try to conclude uh, the essay. <clears throat> well, uh, the first thing that we come upon is this statement by Pope, true wit is nature to advantage dressed, what oft was thought but never so well expressed, it is one of his famous statements and that explains his whole view of literature and literary criticism. What is literature? He says, it is nature to advantage dressed, which means the matter is nature, human nature, life in general, but then it is worded in language and that makes a difference. Everybody cannot have the same felicity with language. Those who have it would excel. And that's where uh, Pope considers himself at the top of the list. And that's why he says, true wit is nature to advantage dressed. Advantage because it improves upon nature. What oft was thought but never so well expressed. Matter is common. It is the same life that all of us see. We live, go through it. But then how many of us can state it in words precisely and not only precisely but in a manner that it is enchanting. That's why what oft was thought but never so well expressed. So the difference between a common writer, an ordinary writer, run of the mill, and an exceptional writer, a great writer, lies in expression, in the style 
because matter is just about the same. Lot of dramatists wrote uh, plays during the Elizabethan age, during the Renaissance as a whole, but then how many could come up to the level of Shakespeare? Shakespeare excelled all. Similarly, in the 18th century, uh, you have Pope excelling everybody in the art of satire. Uh, this reminds me of um, uh, a couplet from Ghalib. He says just about the same thing. Kehte hai ki Ghalib ka hai andaze bayan aur. The same thing uh, is being said by Pope, what, but never so well expressed. People have said it. Hain aur bhi dunya mein sukhanwar bahut achhe. Hain aur bhi dunya mein sukhanwar bahut achhe. Kehte hain ki galib ka hai andaze bayan aur. Pope is saying the same thing. Although there are writers and writers, satirists and satirists, but none comes up to the level of Pope himself. Further, he elaborates the same idea. He says, others for language all their care express and value books as women, men for dress. He says the difference between him and others or the great critic and the ordinary critic is that the ordinary critics run after books. They try to accumulate as much knowledge as possible by reading this, that and other books available to him or her. But then a real poet or a real critic would excel them all in the matter of expression. So it is the language that makes the difference. In other words, the style. Language is the same, but how do you use it? What use do you make? What arrangement of words do you churn out? So that arrangement would determine the quality of your writing. Uh, others for language all their care express and value books as women, men for dress. Look at uh, the comment. In the 18th century, uh, comments upon women were always disparaging. Gender bias Women are considered inferior. They are considered having spurious taste and spurious, you see, likings, dislikings. That's why he says, just as women like men just for their dress, not what the man in the dress is, how intelligent he is, how creative is he, how critical is he is not important. What is important is how well the fellow is dressed. Similarly, he says, ordinary critics would go by uh, books, how many books you have read and so on. Not how many you have assimilated, how many you can reproduce sensibly. So that makes a difference. Mere language using words is not enough. The sense they humbly take upon content, their praise is still, the style is excellent. He says such people will go after words, 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 as Hamlet says. Hamlet in Shakespeare's play is a very good example of a critic because he is reading something and somebody come upon him, Polonius, the character that he hates, the courtier whose job is 
only to praise whatever the king does, any stupid, any insensible thing, because he is to humor the royal, to humor the authority. But then, here is someone like Pope who would go after truth, not after externals, not after dress, not after how many books you have in your library or how many books you have read. What have you gained out of that? What have you become after reading those books? That is important. How much have you absorbed, assimilated and made your own? Words are like leaves, and where they most abound, much fruit of sense beneath is rarely found. Very good example. He says the relationship between word and sense is just like the relationship between fruit and leaves. He says, where there are too many leaves, there will be very little fruit. Similarly, if somebody is using too many words in his style, you can be sure there will not be much sense in it. So the sense and sound relationship, sense and word relationship, that is there. It must be precise. It must be speaking words. Otherwise, like Polonius, you just churn out words in praise of the authority, meaning nothing. And that's why Hamlet has to comment when he's confronted with, my lord, how do you feel about this speech? He says, words, words, words. They mean nothing. There is no sense in it. They are empty words. False eloquence like the prismatic glass. Its gaudy color spreads on every place. He says eloquence for its own sake. Eloquence means loud delivery using big words, mouth-filling words. He says it is just like the eloquence of a reflector, a glass. It reflects all sorts of things, even different colors. But then, actually, it's plain glass. It's nothing. So that is the relationship between uh, sense and sound or sense and words. But true expression, like the unchanging sun, clears and improves whatever it shines upon. So he compares style with the sun. He says the true style, the great style, is like the sun. Whatever it touches, it improves it. It will become more shining because of the light of the sun and it will gain in appearance. Similarly, he says, true style, great style, like the sun, will improve the, the presentation. Otherwise, nature is the same. Life is the same. Before Shakespeare, so many dramatists, including Marlowe, Ben Johnson, uh, they, they wrote about the same life, Elizabethan life. But then, they are not so well remembered or valued as Shakespeare is because he has a greater style of presentation, more effective, more speaking. So that is the difference between a great writer and an ordinary writer. 
great writer has mastery of style and style improves upon the matter. Expression is the dress of thought and still appears more decent as more suitable. He says no doubt, style is like the dress of a person. It gives you appearance, it gives you looks. And better the style, uh, the more impressive the looks. He says no doubt. But at the same time, style is not merely for appearance. Style is not merely to make uh, the matter impressive. Style also contributes to uh, the sense, to the presentation of the sense. It, it contributes to the, the meaning of the sense. Expression is the dress of thought and still and yet appears more decent as more suitable. If it is more suitable, then it will appear more decent. He means to say sense and sound must be blended. It should not look something extra, should not look something super added something which is dressing up of the, the matter or material which is not as impressive. So then uh, it becomes a poor substitute for the real style. A wild conceit in pompous words expressed is like a clown in regal purple dressed. <laughs> he says, a misplaced comparison, a misplaced image, simile or metaphor or symbol. These are the comparisons, devices of comparison. He says, if they are overblown, if they are exaggerated, then obviously, they would look misplaced. He gives the example of a clown who is dressed in the royal robes, the dress of a king. So he would look more funny. Similarly, he says, if the matter is not dignified, if the matter is not great, Mere greatness of style is not going to work. So the two must blend with each other, must be true to each other, must be appropriate to each other. Otherwise, any sort of dichotomy will tell upon the presentation. For different styles with different subjects sort, as several garbs with country, town, and court. He says styles are like dresses, and dresses look appropriate only if they fit into the occasion, the ceremony. For example, you can't use casual dress at a formal occasion. If it is ceremonial, like your marriage, you can't wear a casual dress. Similarly, if you are addressing a gathering, if you are on the pulpit, on the stage, you can't afford to be casual about your dress. It must inspire uh, respect for you. You can't have people laughing at you and you are making a speech. So the two things must coincide with each other. They must fit into each other. The matter and the manner, the sound and the sense, the subject and the style, they have to be in harmony with each other. 
the moment there is any sort of disharmony, then the whole effect will be gone. And he gives the example of different dresses for different places, country, town and court. Country comes lowest because you have poor and illiterate people there and they would not be very conscious of dress, they would wear any. But then, if you are in the town, you are more conscious about your dress. You will be better dressed. You have sophisticated people, educated people, rich people. So, obviously, dresses will be different, superior, better. And the highest will be in the court, because in the court you have the chosen courtiers and the king, the royal. So accordingly, uh, there are levels of dresses too. Just as there are levels of the, the uh, dignity of people. True ease in writing comes from art, not chance. As those move easiest to have learned to dance. And he says, the felicity, the smoothness, the movement in the style will come not by chance, but by training. You have to master the art of the style. You have to master the words, dictionary, vocabulary, different styles for different occasions. If you can do that, then you are bound to fumble. You are bound even to make a fool of yourself. So you must know the distinction between one thing and the other. And everything will require its own kind of dressing. So uh, uh, Pope compares style with dressing. Just as the countryman, the town man, the court man are differently dressed. Similarly, different styles according to the subject. Because you can't write every subject in the same style. For example, if you are writing comedy, a light piece, humorous piece, you can't write tragedy in the comic style. Somebody uh, dies, there is fight between people for honor and people get killed. So you can't laugh at them. You can't be humorous about the situation. So you will have to write in tragic style. Then similarly, there are romances. That's why in Shakespeare, you have comedies, you have tragedies, you have romances, and yes, you have also histories, Roman history, Julius Caesar, Antony Cleopatra, etc., etc. Similarly, English history, Henry the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Richard the Second, Third, all these are history plays. So there you have to be careful about not violating the sanctity of the history, truth, the matter, the substance, and your style must be appropriate. You can't be describing the king in the style of the clown. It has to be appropriate to the personality that you are describing. So this is the relationship, congenial relationship harmonious relationship between sound and sense, substance and style, or subject and style. The two must go together. There can't be any dichotomy. There can't be any uh, clash of interests. The moment there is clash, then the whole thing collapses. And therefore, ease in writing comes. Felicity. 
felicity will come only if you are master of words if you have no mastery of words you are not going to have a smooth style some foreign writer some our own despise the ancients only or the moderns prize the sweat like faith by each man is applied to one small sect and all are damned beside he says unfortunately in our time which means 18th century in literature also in criticism in writing sects have emerged coteries schools everybody thinks he is like like the priest and he controls his temple he says that is why we have writers and writers authorities and authorities each writer considers himself an authority and as some inept followers and therefore create a school create just like there are sects in religion this sect that sect all sorts of faiths so you have numerous religions he says similarly in writing you have numerous schools of writing and they take pride in belonging to this school or that school pope says no writing well is not a matter of following one sect or another sect excellence is only one excellence cannot be a matter of faith cannot be uh, a matter of this that and that it has to be one and one only which is either you have it or you don't have it and uh, it is silly to prize one set of writers and condemn the other he says some prize the ancient writers some prize the medieval writers some prize the modern writers and on the same pattern some condemn one and some condemn the other he says this kind of judgment is not sound judgment must be one there must be a standard judgment to measure the quality of writing either you have that quality or you do not have that quality if you fall short then no other criterion can be applied but he says in our time there are criteria upon criteria There's so many well we will uh, continue our discussion after a short break thank you
Okay, to resume our discussion of uh, Pope as a critic. And as I said, although he titles his criticism an essay on criticism, to repeat, it's not really an essay. Because essay is a single theme developed and then concluded. Here it is a series of statements and statements of different kinds. One kind is that he is expressing his thoughts, what he thinks of literature and good literature, what he thinks of good criticism and bad criticism. He does that. At the same time, he cannot help hitting his rivals, whom he would consider lesser in stature than himself. That is what he does. So, uh, it goes on. Let's see what he says next. Some foreign writers, some of our own despise, the ancients only, or the moderns prize, the sweet like faith by each man is applied. To one small sect and all are damned beside. So he is condemning the sectarian approach. He says approach to literature should not be sectarian because the, the measurement of excellence is only one. The parameter is one. You cannot have different parameters for different kinds of literature. Literature was written in ancient times, then in modern times, and then in medieval times. It has always been written, and by all sorts of people. So the only parameter to be used is whether a writer is good or bad, not whether he belongs to this sect or that sect is a matter of excellence. Either you have it or you don't have it. So his standard for that matter is very high. He is aiming at the ideal and that is why he praises the ancients, the greatest ones, and does not consider his own contemporaries good enough for his praise. Regard not then if wit be old or new, but blame the false and value still the true. He says it doesn't matter whether a poet is ancient or medieval or a medieval or modern. What is all important is whether a particular poet is good or not good. Excellent or not excellent? So it is a question of merit. It is not a question of this sect or that sect. And further he says, faith, gospel, all seemed made to be disputed. And none had sense enough to be confuted. He says these so-called schools just like so-called faiths, different sects in religion. Similarly, different schools in literature, in poetry or drama, or even criticism. He says it's not a healthy growth. Healthy growth is to forget about one's location. Time and place, that's not important. What is important is the quality of writing he has left behind, which we are reading, whether it is worth recommending or not worth recommending. That is the only consideration to be made. And further, Good nature and good sense must ever join. 
to err is human, to forgive divine. A famous statement, we keep quoting it, to err is human, to forgive divine. He says, nobody can be perfect. No human can be perfect. Only God is perfect. But then, we do expect an effort to arrive at perfection. At least that effort should be there. You should not be casual or careless about what you are writing. If you are doing that, then you are not doing your job sincerely and not doing it well. Of course, you cannot be godlike. We grant that. But at the same time, you must try to be perfect as man. Try to reach the limit of your excellence. The limit that humans have, at least that should be aimed at. So Pope is a master of statements, to err is human, to forgive divine. It is human to make mistakes and it is divine-like, it's like God to forgive. Well, it is true not only of writing but of life. Great men like Buddha or Gandhi and so on, Christ, they could forgive even their own murderers. Gandhi was murdered and yet he forgave the one who did it. God bless him. So that is the greatness. He says similarly in writing no writer can be perfect and we should have the, the uh, good sense enough to understand the error, to understand the limitation. Humans are bound to have limitation. So rather than condemn a writer for his limitations, we must appreciate for whatever virtues there are. Learn then what morals critics ought to show, for it's but half a judge's task to know. It's not enough Taste, judgment, learning, join. In all you speak, let truth and candor shine. So now, after criticizing the limitations, after pointing out the limitations, all sorts of limitations, he comes to the positives. What are the positive qualities of good writing? Both in creative writing as well as critical writing. And he says, it's not enough. Taste, judgment, learning, join. These are the necessary ingredients of good writing. You must have taste means you must know what good writing is. Just like the food, you can tell whether it is good or not so good. Similarly, you should develop taste for good writing and you should be able to discriminate between the good and not so good. Judgment, learning, join. So you must develop the sense of judgment, sense of discrimination, and you must have learning means you should be well read. You should have read the entire literature written so far. All these qualities join. Only then you can claim to have some merit as a critic. In all you speak, let truth and candor shine. But he says even those qualities put together are not enough, are not sufficient. 
until and unless all that you speak must be informed by truth and candor. The truth of the substance of the subject and felicity of the style, candor. So both are important, subject and style. What is subject, whether it is noble or ignoble, good or bad, that is important. Similarly, the style has to be in commensurate with the subject. It must fit into it. There should not be any sort of dichotomy or disharmony between the two. Poets are race long, unconfined and free, still fond and proud of savage liberty. He says, poets have had liberty and they must be given. But freedom should not be abused. Freedom should not be misused. It should not become a license to say any sort of nonsense, to write inferior stuff. He says, I am for freedom for the writer. Writer must have the freedom to choose a subject. But we expect from the writer the best of writing. He must do his best. To, uh, to, 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 you see, create appropriate style for the subject of his choice. Horace still charms with graceful negligence and without method talks us into sense. He says great writers Even when they make errors, even when they make mistake, even there, there will be some charm. So the faults of the great are still better, even the virtues of the inferior. Not that he is, uh, is absolving the writers of all errors, no. He is only saying the great writers when they are liable to make mistakes, commit errors, even there, uh, there will be something to learn about. Will like a friend, yeah, and without method talks us into sense will, like a friend, familiarly convey the truest notions in the easiest way. He means to say that truth of substance and the ease of style, felicity, they have to be blended. And more per perfect the blending, more enjoyable will be the reading. So the substance and the style, the subject and the style, they must be blended into one whole, a smooth movement. See Dionysius Homer's thoughts refined and call new beauties forth from every line. He says, even the great writers can be improved upon. Not that you must write every time something new. You can always also try to edit 
the older writers and you can do service there you can find errors you can correct them you can also improve upon weak expressions if there are any there will be if somebody is writing several hundred pages of poetry he can't be perfect in every line somewhere or the other is bound to make mistakes or at least go into some sort of weakness commit errors so there is always scope for improvement even in the writings of the greatest like homer he gives the example and that job can be done by the lesser writers they can also contribute they can improve upon the weaker expressions he who supreme in judgment as in wit might boldly censure as he boldly writ yet judged with coolness though he sung with fire his precepts teach but what his works inspire he says ultimately the test of great writer or great critic is his own books whatever is said in the books that ultimately will be the value it is not mere style not mere bombast not mere words which are going to last ultimately the value of your, your books will be the subject the substance there is in the words and that alone is going to last then he gives the example of uh, quintilian uh, dionysius homer and comes to longinus lot of examples i skip those examples and then concludes thus long succeeding critics justly reigned license repressed and useful laws ordained he says great critics have ruled the literary world for a long time why they did so because the the rules that they framed were drawn from their long years of reading they read all that was available and read it over and over again and only after that exercise long exercise they concluded certain general principles and general rules on which those books were written it may be homer's epics it may be quintilian's poetry or longinus's anima you have to spend hours and hours years in years to master a particular book and only when you have mastered it you have a right to uh, right to pass judgment right to conclude uh, the merit of the book <clears throat> thus long succeeding critics justly reigned license repressed and useful laws ordained they did not take license liberty irresponsible swing with any writer they read them over and over again and finally came upon the principles lying behind uh, those writings learning and rome alike in empire grew and art still followed where her eagles flew well he says the roman empire 
is still held up as the supreme example of empire. The strongest empire ever was in history, where Julius Caesar and then many more Caesars, ten Caesars, they ruled. And the empire was spread all over Europe, Asia, Africa. They were ruling all these continents. At that time, Australia was not discovered. There was no life there. But these three continents, full of countries, sects, faiths, cultures, they were governed by them. He says at the same time, the literature of Rome was as great as the empire was. So there is a link between the two. No wonder in ancient times arts were patronized by the royalty, by the authority, by the rulers. And arts were nourished by them because they had the means. The artist doesn't have the means. So to make life easy for the artist, the rulers can do that. But the problem with the rulers is they would like themselves to be praised. They would like everything they do to be praised. They don't want to see any criticism. A writer can't do that. A writer has to be honest with himself. A writer has to value only one thing and that is the truth. But truth is not palatable to the powers that be. Hence the conflict between the two. So writer is welcome to the authority so long as uh, he is praising the authority. But the moment he starts offering criticism, he will be done away with, banished. So many writers were banished, thrown out of the countries, and so many were killed just because they uttered the truth. But then great writers wouldn't care for the consequences they must say the truth, just as in Shakespeare, the woman of the man who is a murderer, Macbeth, she finally utters, truth must come out. So truth is supreme for any honest writer, for any great writer. Those who make compromises cannot be great writers. That's what Pope is doing. With the tyranny then superstition joined, as that the body this enslaved the mind. He says, during tyrannical reigns, regimes, when the rulers were ruthless, when the rulers were cruel, when the rulers had no respect for truth, they throttled the truthful writers. They killed them, they enslaved them, imprisoned them. There were times, medieval times, for example, when faith reigned supreme. If it is Christianity, you have to write in praise of Christianity. If it is Islam, you have to write in praise of Islam. 
if it is hinduism or buddhism you have to write in praise of them if you do otherwise you lose your life so those were also the times in our own time modern times things are better but not everywhere there are pockets of life there are countries and countries laws and laws from bangladesh you remember asina said she sorry she is the ruler uh, uh, the writer she was expelled she is living in calcutta but then true and great writers they do not make compromise they are ready to sacrifice even their lives but not ready to compromise on truth that has been the history and that's what pope is praising and uh, he says tyranny and superstition will not merely tyranny superstition is equally tyrannical people of faith for example they will be superstitious also that's why there was time when in the west writers were crucified like christ women were called witches and they were burnt alive john of arc so it is very hard to to digest truth particularly for the rulers because they are full of powers they are power mad and that madness plays havoc with truth with writers who want to propagate truth goes on gives examples and so on but we brave britons foreign laws despised and kept unconquered and uncivilized i is uh, making fun of britons calling them brave but actually foolish <laughs> so we never learn from people around us from rome or from the greeks we never learned and we continue to be as uncivilized and stupid as we ever were and no wonder we were not able to produce any great writer shakespeare by then was not considered great because 18th century was neo classical they will consider great only whoever is following the classical rules shakespeare don't do that okay thank you for the time being we'll meet again definitely sir thank you so very much for giving us a productive session and dear friends we would we would be meeting again soon and would be discussing more under the series uh, history of uh, literary criticism till then take care goodbye thank you sir thank you once again thank you.